I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the president and the GOP roll out their framework to rewrite the U.S. tax code and the world's most valuable companies could be in the crosshairs. Will targeting trillions of dollars in offshore profits be a problem for big tech? We will discuss. Plus, Amazon steps up its hardware game with a suite of new products hitting. We will preview the new lineup and ask if it means Amazon has the upper hand this holiday shopping season. And the iPhone 10 might not be ready for prime time. We'll dig into the latest production delay at Cupertino for the highly anticipated device and the potential threat to sales growth. But first, to our lead. President Trump and Republican leaders have unveiled their long-awaited overhaul to the American tax code. The president unveiled the plan while speaking in Indianapolis. Corporations have parked many trillions of dollars in foreign countries and many have incorporated abroad in order to avoid our punitive tax system altogether. And some companies actually leave our country because they have so much money overseas, so much, it's an incredible amount, that they move the company to get their money. We're going to let them bring the money back home. That was the president stressing one of the major points of the tax plan overhaul, how to get U.S. companies to bring back the profits they have stashed overseas. It's estimated that U.S. firms have $2.6 trillion in profits offshore. Apple leads the way with over $260 billion. Here with me now to discuss Alexis Leondis, who heads the tax team at Bloomberg News out of our Washington bureau. Alexis, thanks so much for joining us. So talk to us about the nuts and bolts here and what this means for tech companies in particular that have all of these profits stashed offshore. Sure. Sure. Well, today was certainly a big tax day. Companies were really poised and waiting to see what the president and congressional leaders were going to reveal in terms of a tax plan. And one of the things that came out was that there would, in fact, be a rate for repatriation. And that's the money, of course, that companies have stashed offshore. Um, and while a rate wasn't specified in the plan, it did say that there would be two levels, one rate applied to cash and one lower rate applied to non-cash. So is there any sense of what the repatriation rate might be? I mean, that's the money question right? Of course. That's one of the many questions that remains after, uh, you know, everyone saw the plan today. Um, the only kind of guidance that we have is that back in 2014, the former Ways and Means chairman, Dave Camp, came out with a tax plan that called for a split repatriation rate as well, 8.75 percent for cash, 3.5 percent for non-cash. We've heard that tax writers are looking and borrowing heavily from the Camp plan, so it's possible that's the rate we could see. But again, everything is still in flux. What other international national tax changes could these companies see? Sure. Well, it's complicated, but one of the things um, that the plan does lay out is a shift to a territorial system. Right now, the U.S. is kind of unique in that it um, refers to, it has a global system, what's referred to as a global system, where companies have to pay earnings, have to pay taxes on their earnings regardless of where they're, where they're made. The shift to a territorial system would mean that they only owe tax on earnings that are made in the U.S. So let's take a company like Apple, for example, and I know we don't know the exact numbers, but $260 billion in cash offshore. What would this potential rate that, that we're talking about mean for them? Well, I think it really depends on how much of that is in cash and how much of that is not in cash. Um, obviously, we know that companies like Apple, um, tech companies specifically, tend to have the highest amounts of profit offshore, as do pharma companies. So they're really going to be, I think, looking, scouring to figure out what the best way is to try to pay that rate. The other thing I should add is that um, the taxes will be owed. They can, the companies can pay those taxes over several years. Um, so that is something as well that they'll obviously be taking into account. How are the companies responding? Do we know yet? We're making calls. We're trying to figure out. Um, but I think the number one thing we know is they're certainly sending their lobbyists to Capitol Hill to make sure that the rate is as low as it can possibly be. All right. Bloomberg's Alexis Leondis, thank you so much for joining us from Washington. All right, well, Amazon seems to have found its hardware calling in the Amazon Echo. The tech giant held an event earlier in Seattle to unveil a number of new products, including an improved Alexa-powered smart home hub, a smaller Echo speaker, and a version of its compact Echo with a screen called Spot. Amazon also announced Alexa will be coming to BMW cars starting next year. The product ramp up just shows that the tech giant will not back down to the likes of Apple or Google. Joining me now from Seattle, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who attended the event. So, Mark, uh, talk to us about what this means in context for Seattle's and Amazon's push into the home. 
This is Amazon stepping up to the plate here and heralding itself as a major consumer technology player. No longer is it just Apple and Google and other players who can hold the splashy event to announce a bunch of new tech products in succession. Amazon is saying they're here now too. And they really stepped up their smart home game, introducing several new Echo speakers as well as a new set-top box product for the home. So, Mark, you know, you review all of these products. How does this stack up to what Google has with Google Home and what Apple is planning to unveil in December with the HomePod? So, Google has their home speaker. It's the center of their smart home world. Apple has their single HomePod speaker coming out in December, and that's also going to become the center hub of their smart home world. And then around those products, they have other devices. Apple has the Apple TV, the iPhone, the iPad, some iPods, and their services. Google has the Pixel phones and their Chromecast and TV products and their operating system, Android. But what Amazon is saying is, we're going to make the smart home our entire category. We're going to take over every different part of the home. So not only do they have a smaller $100 mid-tier speaker, but they have a new high-end speaker that allows you to connect your lights and other smart home appliances to your network. And a new Fire TV product, as well as a new Echo Spot, which I think, at least for me, really stole the show. It's this $130 little half-circle device with about a two-and-a-half-inch screen. It's a little bigger than, like, an Apple Watch screen. You can make video calls from it. You can watch video, listen to music, read lyrics, get contacts, learn about your day, your calendar, your weather. So what you see is Amazon coming out with smart home devices and speakers for all parts of your life. And you also alluded to the BMW partnership. We're seeing another car maker getting Alexa. So basically Amazon is trying to stick Alexa wherever you are. Do you think we'll see more partnerships in the future with other car makers, for example? So this is the third one. They announced partnerships with uh, Volkswagen as well as Ford at the beginning of the year. I haven't seen many new models with those Alexa functions come out as of yet. BMW was on stage at the event today at the Seattle office. You can see behind me. And they talked about how some of their new cars, a couple of models, one sedan, one SUV, will come out in the middle of the year with Alexa. It's interesting. Will, will someone buy a new car just because it has Alexa support in it? I don't think that's going to drive any sales or new purchase intent for the consumer on the car side. But it certainly is a big win for Amazon, being able to allow someone to potentially be in their car driving home. Their spouse calls them and say, hey, we're out of, uh, you know, cat litter for the cat or out of something. They can just say, you know, Alexa, whatever and that will let them buy it through their car. So it's a deep tie, a big win for Amazon there. You know, in using Amazon Alexa, it's certainly got the cool factor. There are some cool things that you can do, but Alexa still gets confused sometimes. It seems that this, the voice recognition uh, aspect of it still has a long way to go. Did Amazon address any of that today? Well, we saw a lot of new functionality on the developer side. So they introduced a lot of first-party products, this new hardware. But in terms of functionality, they're relying a lot on third parties. So there's new deep integrations with other devices like lights and thermostats and TV sets, what you would have in your home. New ways to integrate with other parts of your life. There's these new Echo buttons, which sort of lets you make games and play games by clicking different buttons that connect to your home speaker uh, via Alexa. There is ways to go in this voice space. Uh, there is lots of AI stuff that they're working on. There's actually a presentation going on now uh, that I'm missing that for this, but it's worth it. Totally worth talking to you anytime, Emily. I'm uh, talking about their advances on the uh, on the AI side as well. So right. we'll see more from them on that. Well, thank you for taking time out of a very important presentation to join us. Uh, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, you'll have to update us on all the rest. Thanks so much, Mark, there from Seattle. All right. Well, teaming up to develop self-driving cars, Ford and Lyft, the automaker and the ride-hailing service have announced they will share data to develop the systems and technology needed to design affordable driverless automobiles and eventually get them onto Lyft's network. This move comes as Ford's rival GM bought a 9% stake in Lyft in January of last year for $500 million, and those two companies are still considering other options to expand ride-sharing offerings. Coming up, it's Ad Week here in New York. We will break down how Twitter and Facebook are changing the game. This is Bloomberg.
says it had success fighting fake news in the recent German federal election. The company says it launched a major effort in the country to combat fake news, deploying new methods it's developed in the months since President Trump was elected in the U.S. While the right-wing alternative for Germany, or AFD party, made historic gains in the election, Richard Allen, Facebook's vice president of public policy in Europe, said in a blog post that, quote, these actions did not eliminate misinformation entirely in the election, but they did make it harder to spread and less likely to appear in people's news feeds. Studies concluded that the level of false news was low. Sticking with Facebook, President Trump is taking aim at the social network, tweeting, Facebook was always anti-Trump, the networks were always anti-Trump, hence fake news. New York Times and Washington Post, always anti-Trump. Collusion? The tweet comes after Facebook revealed last week that it'll turn over the 3,000 political ads it says were bought with Russian money in last year's presidential campaign. Facebook is making a larger push to attract advertisers as it broadens its media content, a key topic of conversation this week at Ad Week in New York. Joining us now to discuss, Ben Lair, CEO of Group 9, whose portfolio includes Thrillist, Now This, and more. Also with us, Jerry Smith, who covers media for Bloomberg News. So Jerry, you can tell us all about what's happening at Ad Week. What are they saying about Facebook and all of this news? Yeah, I mean, I think exactly what you were just saying is that Facebook is really making an aggressive push to try and take away um, advertising dollars from TV networks. Uh, you know, they just launched Facebook Watch, and there's a lot of publishers, online publishers, that are producing content for that. Um, so, you know, that that's really where there's this big push here is there's, you know, a $70 billion market for television advertising, and Facebook wants a piece of it, uh, Google wants a piece of it, um, and the TV networks, um, you know, right now they have, the lion's share of that, but there is some shift going to digital. Are they concerned about the fake news? Are they concerned about this Russia issue? Advertisers? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I, I think that advertisers are extremely conservative. They're very concerned about their brand appearing next to content that's questionable. We saw YouTube have a real problem with that earlier this year. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, advertisers are very concerned about their content showing up uh, alongside fake news as well. Ben, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, Facebook is successful in sort of shaking some of that money out of television. Uh, that's, you know, that's sort of the model that we're building at Group 9 is to right. create content uh, for these platforms mm -hmm. um, sort of in advance of the money showing up but knowing the consumer attention has shifted there. And ad dollars always lag consumers mm -hmm. um, in sort of any big shift. And so I think over the next few years you'll see um, money start to move more and more from TV into where people are spending time, which is in mobile and mobile video specifically. Facebook and Google are really gobbling up the digital ad pie. I mean, how much is left over for companies like you? Yeah, so well, so if you look at how TV has traditionally been bought, um, advertisers are buying directly from the cable networks, yet in digital, the sort of ecosystem is set up so that you're buying from the platforms mm -hmm. rather than from the media brands. That's problematic as a media brand um, building on these platforms, but I think a shift is happening now and it's gonna take a long time where um, as Facebook and Google specifically, but, but you know, Snapchat and Twitter as well are looking at that $70 billion in TV and wanting to get it, they have to place more value on premium content because that context is so important to advertisers and so um, in needing that premium content, they start to have to uh, share some of that pie and so that's what Facebook has done with the launch of Watch. Facebook is now starting to actually pay uh, content creators for content. Right. Um, they're, they're doing more to share advertising. It's still early, um, but also the competition between these platforms mm -hmm. is important. And so when YouTube was the only show in town, publishers had mm -hmm. no, lov no leverage. Right. Um, now with multiple platforms sort of competing for premium content, I think it's a good time to be a premium content creator. And I do believe that there's gonna be a huge business, although it will take time. And you guys have the Dodo, which has a show called The Comeback kid yep. which is doing very well yeah. as uh, I hear the I mean we have, we have 24 shows on mm -hmm. Facebook watch and we'll have many more because and what kind of engagement are you seeing well uh, so comeback kids is the number one show on Facebook watch mm -hmm. uh, so far we're seeing um, uh, over 20 million views per episode um, over 20 million minutes of viewing per episode mm -hmm. You can hold that up to sort of almost anything in linear TV, yeah. um, enormous scale. Granted, all of our shows are not um, the number one show on the platform, but collectively, uh, in less than three weeks, we've had over 100 million views. We have over a half a million uh, followers to these shows. So I think of a follower as almost like the linear network TV version of like a TiVo uh, yeah. subscriber to a program. Um, 
we're building fan bases, we're building great engagement, growing engagement. Uh, we're really pleased with the early results, uh, but uh, this is going to shake out over an extended period of time. Jerry, do you think the traditional TV networks, the bigger names, are going to embrace Facebook Watch, or is it a wait and see? You know, I, I think it is a little bit of a wait and see. I mean, you know, you talk about Trump's tweet and the idea that Facebook and media companies are colluding. My conversations with media companies, the farthest thing is collusion. I mean, there are actually a lot of, there's some frustration with Facebook in terms of Facebook will ask media companies, produce content for our latest initiative, and there's some frustration that they're not getting the kind of uh, financial terms that they'd hoped for. Mm. It seems like Facebook in the last year has really made an effort to try to reach out to the journalism community, the media community, um, to really try and, you know, meet their needs. So I, I think Facebook's starting to come around, but the idea that they're colluding together is, is actually kind of funny considering there's actual real tension there between the two sides. All right, Jerry Smith, uh, Bloomberg News, who covers media for us. Ben Lair of Group 9, always great Thanks to have you here me. on the show. All right, coming up, publisher McGraw-Hill is undergoing a digital transformation with its textbooks. We will hear from the CEO of its education division next. And be sure to tune in for our conversation with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella this week on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, an in-depth conversation about his tenure at Microsoft, the cloud, the broader tech industry, the future of AI. We talk about it all airs this Thursday, 5.30 p.m., New York time. This is Bloomberg. It has been quite a journey of trans. How do you transform a century old education publisher into a leader in digital learning? sell it to a private equity group, and install a CEO focused on turning software into the new textbook. That is the route McGraw-Hill Education has taken in the last four years since it was bought by Apollo Global Management. Bloomberg's Emma Chandra spoke with CEO David Levine about the transition from old tech to new. It has been quite a journey of transformation. I mean, what we bought was a, an old line textbook publisher, and we've had to make it relevant. And what we've done with that is we've put about $700 million to work spending a lot of money thinking about how you can improve outcomes in education through using software. And that's been the thrust of what we've done. So it's about becoming a digital company? Well, it's actually about becoming a results company. Uh, we call it a learning science company, using a combination of psychology and cognitive sciences to help people do better in their education. And so tell us about this software. What are you actually providing? I right. know you're, you've been working, you've been acquiring software companies, you're working with AI. How, how does it all well, figure for, for, for McGraw-Hill? When I went to school, we learned by reading a book. Now we've turned the paradigm over. The book reads us. So what do I mean by that? We've taken the content, we've studied it with probes and questions, we've linked the answers back to a piece of AI. So basically now, the book is seeing what you know, what you don't know how confident you are, how confident you're not, where you're lacking confidence, how accurate you are and how inaccurate you are. And on the back of that is then helping guide you on a very personal path of learning. And that personal path is going to be better because you and I would have different backgrounds in this given mm -hmm. subject. One of us might go farther, one of us might go faster, but we all can get there. And the software is very good at making sure you get there in the end, which is the most important thing of all. So the textbook is almost becoming like a teaching assistant in a way. And you've called it correctly. It's a teaching assistant because one of the things it does is it gives a lot of data. And the data goes both to the student, but also critically to the teacher or the instructor to say, look, you're looking into this class. Wouldn't it be useful to know what they don't know? 
just before you give that lecture that you've given many, many times before, here's a problem that they're all stumbling on. Begin with that. So there's a lot of insight that comes out of that learning data for the first time now. So what proportion is digital now of McGraw-Hill? Uh, let's talk about percentage revenue, th things like that. Right. How much have you become this new tech as opposed to the old tech? Well, people are, people are always surprised. In higher ed, it's now more than two thirds so wow. far this year is digital, which is it's been a rapid change. Um, you know, it was under 20 percent and maybe that wasn't really quite true. Now it's two thirds and it's absolutely software based. K-12, it's a smaller number, but that's because K-12 is more complicated to do this in and the infrastructure's worth. Do you see yourself becoming 100%? No, I think, you know, we, we, don't, we don't want to be sort of fundamentalist about this or that. And there will always be markets for which print is, is, you know, is better, small graduate classes, or even those very first years of learning to read. You might find that there's going to be a much longer persistence of print in those. If you are in undergraduate education, more likely than not, you're going to be doing it digitally. McGraw-Hill Education CEO David Levine there. Coming up, Apple has reportedly hit a production snag on the iPhone 10. We'll explore why the iPhone maker could be falling behind next. And a feature I want to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. Find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. Send our producers a message. Play along with the charts we show you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's get a check of first word news. President Trump traveled to Indianapolis where he unveiled a tax plan he said would provide, quote, historic relief to the American people. Tax reform will protect low income and middle income households, not the wealthy and well connected. They can call me all they want. It's not going to help. I'm doing the right thing. And it's not good for me, believe me. The proposed overhaul will cut the corporate tax rate from 35 to 20 percent. For individuals, the tax brackets would be 12, 25, and 35 percent. An international chemical weapons watchdog is commending Russia for destroying its artillery of deadly gas stockpiled during the Cold War era. Officials reported the destruction of all remaining projectiles to Russian President Vladimir Putin today. It cost Russia an estimated $5 billion. U.S. Marines have arrived in Puerto Rico. The Navy released video today of troops and supplies arriving on the island. More than two dozen ships and thousands of troops will eventually arrive there to distribute aid. Power is still out to much of the island as the humanitarian crisis worsens by the day. Maria has strengthened off the coast of North Carolina and is now a hurricane again. The storm is expected to hover above the Atlantic and not hit land. Dangerous rip currents and huge waves are expected along the east coast over the next couple of days. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. It's just 5.30 here in New York, 7.30 Thursday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Let's start over in New Zealand, where the Reserve Bank of New Zealand held the country's cash rate at one and three quarter percent this morning, as expected. Uh, the New Zealand dollar a little changed on that news. Like I said, it wasn't a surprise, and that was the first uh, decision for the acting governor Grant Spencer, who'll take over soon. On the markets here in Australia, ASX futures higher by about four tenths of one percent after U.S. stocks closed in the positive. Nikkei futures are positive as well. Uh, keep an eye on the polit political scene in uh, Japan today. The cabinet to decide an election date is very likely that it's going to be October the 22nd. Some IPO action in Hong Kong. Zhong An is listing the first major fintech listing in Hong Kong. Uh, China's largest insurer is said to have raised one and a half billion dollars. That is backed by billionaire investor Jack Ma and SoftBank as well uh, was one of the early investors on Zhong An. Elsewhere we're waiting on China's second quarter balance of payments and South Korea's CPI in September. That's expected to slip to 2.2 percent on year. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
Bloomberg Technology, I'm Emily Chang. Apple is already facing production delays to its top of the line iPhone 10. The delays come due to problems with the 3D sensor manufacturing process. Reports saying that the makers of the components used in facial recognition technology are struggling to hit adequate production levels. Here with all the details, Bloomberg's Alex Webb, who covers Apple for us. So, Alex, what do we know? Well, we know from the reports yesterday, initially from Nikkei, there were some problems with the 3D sensors, and that's causing some delays to the production process. Then subsequently, the Wall Street Journal, kudos to them, they dug into it a little bit more, and it's the sensor which projects the, um, the infrared dots on your face, which then helps map your face for the um, 3D sensor facial recognition system that Apple has. We don't quite know the extent to which that will affect how many phones are on the shelves come November the 3rd, though? Well, that was my next question is, you know, to what extent do we know how all of these things that we're learning about are actually going to impact supply? So, you know, going back to the start of September when Apple unveiled these two phones, they had the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 10. And for the first time ever, as far as I know, um, in terms of iPhone releases, they staggered the release. So the iPhone 8 is already on shelves. You can go out and buy one, assuming they have supply. You can go out and buy one right now. There's a six-week window, though, until the iPhone 10 becomes available. Because we knew going into this cycle, there were some problems with the OLED screens. Now, Apple said that those delays were taken into account when they made their projections for the current quarter, the one which ends on the 30th, um, but we don't know to what extent these 3D sensor delays were taken into account when they said the release date will be November the 3rd. If it was, then investors don't have anything to worry about, that, you know, on this front at least. If they did, then it might be that they're in short supply come that day and the, uh, the, they will not be able to meet demand, and that is something which might be a cause for concern. Could this be or give us some answer as to why the release was staggered with the iPhone 8? out last week and the iPhone 10 not out till November. Yes, I mean, it could be one of the factors. OLED is, of course, the other one. Um, there are only a handful of factories in the world making these organic light-emitting diode uh, displays, which, are, which give it this sharper, um, wider display for the, for the iPhone 10. But we did know there had been some problems with the, um, you know, fix, getting these 3D sensor systems working. We weren't quite aware of the extent of the issue. Um, it, it's really going to, we, we're obviously doing our own reporting, digging into it, seeing exactly what the case is. The problem seems to be in what they call the module makers. You have all these different components which you piece together to make the 3D sensor package itself, which then goes into the phone. It's there that the, the sticking point seems to be. The people delivering those components, the, the, um, they are doing okay, but it's the, the module assemblers, and that's as far as we know, LG Inatech in South Korea, and Sharp, um, the, the, the uh, Japanese company, which is owned by Foxconn, um, those seem to be the places where they've got issues. It's interesting given that Tim Cook was Apple's COO for many years. He was the supply chain genius and, you know, obviously, you know, probably knows more about the supply chain than anyone at Apple that at this point, you know, they've been working on this phone for months, if not years. Why wouldn't they be able to stockpile some of these components for the release? I think it possibly speaks to the fact that uh, you know people have been worrying for a while about the extent to which you're really able to deliver blockbuster technological advances in smartphones anymore. So Apple has really been trying to push the envelope, get the latest technology available for their phones. The difference is, of course, the iPhone as, an, as a sim single model is the best-selling smartphone in the world. Samsung sells more smartphones, but they're, of course, a bunch of different models. Um, because it's the best-selling smartphone in the world and they're trying to do this really cutting-edge technology, it's maybe a lot of these companies are not yet at the, the stage where they can deliver all the components necessary. On some of the conference calls for these companies over the past couple of months, they had had a big capital expenditure as they tried to ramp up production and meet Apple's demands. Clearly, some of that hasn't been as successful as anticipated. You know, it's interesting all of this coming at the same time that the iPhone 8 is out and there are, you know, people who are complaining about certain features, something's not working. What do you make of that? Like, How much could it impact sales? Well, we always see a little bit of that. There's always um, this launch of any product. There are some teething problems. Usually, most of it is, is solvable with a software patch. We had the watch last week having some LTE connectivity issues for some of the reviewers. There have been complaints about crackling audio. I literally just got my iPhone 8, so we'll have to see whether that's the case. Um, but the, um, often, and Apple has said in terms of this problem with the crackling audio, that they will be able to remedy it with a software fix. So I wouldn't worry too much about those things. There's investor at any rate. It's the supply issue, which is a far greater consideration and concern. All right, Alex, we'll be waiting for your iPhone 8 review. Alex Webb, Bloomberg Tech, who covers Apple for us. Thank you so much.
Now to a stock we are watching Micron jump the most in six months after reporting earnings that beat estimates and predicting another strong quarter. The memory and storage chips that Micron makes for computers and mobile devices remain in short supply. This as the industry reaps the benefits of curbing spending on new plants and production. Prices are also being bolstered as everything from cars to data centers add more computing capabilities, broadening the market for the electronic components. Coming up, President Trump and Republican leaders have begun their push to overhaul the tax code. What the changes could mean for tech next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. just confirmed Makan Del Rahim as President Trump's pick to head the Justice Department's antitrust division. This comes after a series of hiccups that stalled his nomination for several months. Del Rahim was confirmed as two blockbuster mergers await his review, AT&T's takeover of Time Warner and Bayer's deal for Monsanto. Earlier in the hour, we broke down what President Trump's proposed tax reform means for big tech companies. But what about VC investments and deal making? Joining us from San Francisco, Jennifer Fonstad, co-founder and managing director of Aspect Ventures. Uh, some of the companies in Aspect's portfolio include Birchbox, Stem, and Bobble Bar. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us. Great to have you back here on the show. So let's talk about this tax reform plan. What does it actually mean uh, from your perspective for VC? Well, I think we're very short on details, and I think so. I think we have to look a lot at what the intent is here. And I think what we're seeing is that Trump is viewing this as an opportunity to drive growth, both at small business level as well as repatriation of dollars to, to drive reinvestment back into the economy. So what we're thinking about and what we're looking at is what does it mean to be able to have a five-year write-off for capital spending? What does that look like in terms of the rules around software versus hardware and how that will, how that will play out for some of our startups, for example? Exactly. So for startups in particular, does it seem like this will be beneficial for smaller businesses? I think it has the potential to be very beneficial for s small businesses, particularly, as I mentioned, in really stimulating uh, investment dollars in uh, new infrastructure and such things as software and services that a lot of our companies are selling. So when you think about, for example, cybersecurity, which is a large part of our portfolio, we, we think that a lot of the technology around cybersecurity is, arch is, is fairly archaic and, and clearly not up to um, a level that uh, many large corporations need in order to, to uh, secure their own data. So if this, the rules allow for that type of a write-off of software and cybersecurity software technology, that means a boom boon for new investment in uh, those types of software products. We've been talking about this massive Equifax hack for the last several weeks, the Deloitte hack just this week, the SEC. What is it, what technology is it that these companies don't have that they need? And is it actually being invented? Does it exist? <laughs> I think that's a great question, and I think we're, we're continuing to try and solve that problem. Many of the old infrastructure assumes trying to build a wall around a network and hoping that there is no breach. And much of the new technology is about assuming a breach and then trying to identify and contain, constrain those and, and eradicate those breaches. So really, we're seeing a shift in, in the fundamental model. And a lot of the new technologies are, are under the assumption that we have a breach. How do you shut down those credentials very quickly in order to uh, prevent any data from actually being stolen? Now, cybersecurity has been an area that seems to be ripe for m and I mean, do you think we will see more of that as a result of this? And if so, how and where? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think that we're seeing both an opportunity for M&A as well as in, in the public markets because the types of investments in cybersecurity are woefully uh, um, still behind um, for large corporations. You have a, a number of Fortune 500 companies that now have that uh, as a major issue and an auditable issue um, at the C-suite level. And so 
how that plays out in terms of um, how quickly these companies will grow and whether that becomes a must buy for some of the uh, larger corporates uh, still remains to be seen, but we expect that to be a, a big part of 2018. Do you think these tax reform issues will impact M&A, impact IPOs, impact valuations down the line? Well, again, getting back to the details, it's really hard to know exactly what type of dollars are going to be available. But think, think for example, uh, the trillion plus dollars that are sitting offshore that Trump hopes to bring back to the U.S. If you bring back a significant amount of that capital, could that be used for investing in M&A in order to drive faster growth in some of these categories? That seems to be the question. Now, Jennifer, I got to ask you, you worked at Draper, Draper Fisher Jurvetson for many years. You went on to co-found Aspect with uh, Teresa Go. What has been your reaction to this spate of sexual harassment allegations at big tech companies, startups, in venture capital firms? I mean, there seems to be no end to these stories. Well, I think what's interesting about what we're seeing today is that people are talking about it, and the real shift is not necessarily that there's significant change in some of the behavior, but that there's an opportunity to talk about it as a community and try and drive that change. Again, it's not the majority of behavior. It is, it, it is um, bad, uh, bad acting on the margin, but that bad acting can often permeate, permeate a culture and really create a toxic culture for some of these startups, as we've seen in the case of Uber and SoFi and a few of the others. So what's really, I think, powerful and impactful here is to be able to, to change the culture very early on for many of these companies, uh, particularly the new ones coming along and having a dialogue about how to do that. Um, and having those stories come out has, has been very impactful. Be Our focus has been much more around driving diversity. We think mm -hmm. diversity in general is a competitive advantage for many of these companies, and those companies that really get that early on are the ones that do well. Beyond harassment, which is obviously a huge issue, there's also discrimination, which might be an even bigger issue when it comes to female founders not getting the funding commensurate with, with what a, a male founder might get. What kind of discussion is happening behind the scenes, you know, between you and, and partners at other firms to, to, to change this? I mean, do you think there is a real recognition happening right now, or is this all going to blow over and things are going to go back to the way they were? No, I think that there's a, there's a fundamental sea shift in recognizing that there's a challenge. I thought it was interesting to uh, see uh, the Microsoft CEO um, uh, comment uh, in the New York Times about recognizing that we have a real issue and a long way to go, not just around equal pay, but around creating equal opportunity. And when you have large uh, corporations uh, like, like Microsoft and others, um, Melinda Gates has made a huge initiative as well in, in supporting women in tech. Uh, when you have large uh, impact uh, investors like that and large CEOs recognizing that challenge, you have a fundamental shift in the dialogue and how that permeates their own cultures and how that plays out. Um, in, in the startup community as well. So I think we have a real, we have a real opportunity. Um, certainly in the Aspect portfolio, we're seeing about 40% of our portfolio is, has a women entrepreneur, and we think it's a real hmm. opportunity for uh, diversity more generally to, to really uh, lead to better decision making and ultimately better returns. All right, good to hear. And I'm glad you mentioned the Microsoft CEO because I actually interviewed Satya Nadella this morning. We're going to have that on the show tomorrow. We talked about this. He talked about how their bonuses, his bonus, uh, is now tied to diversity initiatives and actually moving those numbers. So uh, good to hear. Jennifer Fonstad of Aspect Ventures, always great to have you here on the show. All right, well, music streaming service Spotify said to file to go public at the end of the year. That's according to a report from Reuters. The report also notes that private trades in Spotify shares are valuing the company at about $16 billion. Spotify declined to comment for this story. Coming up, China issues a new warning for WhatsApp. Could Facebook's messaging service go away in China completely? We will discuss next. This is Bloomberg.
largest group buying and restaurant review company is building a war chest as it takes on rivals backed by Alibaba. Meituan Dianping is said to be close to finalizing a deal to raise at least $3 billion from investors, including Capital Group. The company backed by Tencent is said to be targeting at least $3 billion at a $28 billion valuation, which would make it the world's fifth most valuable startup, surpassing SpaceX and WeWork. According to people familiar with the matter, it is now hammering out the final details with investors and a deal could be sealed within days. Staying in China, a new warning from that country's government to Facebook's WhatsApp messaging service. The Cyberspace Administration of China says the service should act to stop the spread of illegal information and should take proactive measures to intercept information. This, of course, coming after WhatsApp service was interrupted across China earlier this week. Bloomberg's North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel joins us now from Hong Kong with more. Stephen, we talked about this earlier in the week. What does this message from the Chinese government mean to you? Well, it's interesting that we got a message from the Chinese government because oftentimes when you're reading uh, the different rules and regulations on the Great Firewall of China, it's all about speculation. Oh, is my service blocked? Is it just slow? What's happening? Is it in the crosshairs by regulators? Now we actually got a statement from the Cyberspace Administration in response to questions posed by Bloomberg News, and they came back saying, listen, WhatsApp needs to act to stop the spread of illegal information, quote unquote, uh, in China on the WhatsApp platform and must take proactive measures uh, basically to do what they are already requiring Tencent's WeChat to do because that's a domestic company. WhatsApp obviously run by Facebook. It's uh, the last uh, remaining service by Facebook that is actually available in China. And uh, we've been having intermittent outages, if you will. In July, users reported, including myself, when I was in China in July, I couldn't upload photos or videos. And now on Sunday and Monday, outright out Outage, including the message, the text messaging part of the service. Uh, then all of a sudden on uh, Tuesday or Monday, Tuesday, I guess it was, uh, the service came back on. So this is a sheer, a clear warning from the authorities that they're watching and perhaps they've even found a way to get around the end-to-end -end encryption that Facebook's WhatsApp has employed. China recently fined Tencent. I mean, could fines be on the way for WhatsApp or Facebook? Yeah, you have to question what the efficacy of the fines would be, but yes, they could obviously find them. Uh, the Cyberspace Administration has been cracking down on Baidu, on Weibo, on Tencent. Uh, because in Guangdong and in Beijing, they've just, in the last week or two, uh, levied heavy fines for various uh, violations, including uh, the, the alleged spread of propaganda and also terrorism uh, material. So they're really cracking down ahead of the 19th Party Congress, which does start in three weeks from now. The big question is, are these temporary measures, which we've had in many years past before these big political powwows, or is this a lasting uh, you know, enforcement that is going to go on for years. Meantime, are there other messaging services in China that are benefiting from this disruption? Yeah, I mean, of course, there's WeChat, which is the big one, nearly a billion users by Tencent, and that is the dominant uh, ecosystem, if you will. But, of course, there's Weibo or several versions of Weibo as well from Sina. Uh, Alibaba has a few of these various messaging apps they use for Taobao for traders to communicate. I know Shanda has Uni, which, uh, and there was Momo as well, which started as a dating app. Uh, and there's Telegram as well, which came from the Russians, which, uh, interestingly, a lot of the Bitcoin uh, groups went over to Telegram when WeChat groups were being cracked down uh, could they, so they could talk about strategies about getting their money to overseas wallets. Uh, so there are a few other niche players, but again, WeChat is the dominant one domestically. And do we expect, Stephen, more disruptions as we get closer to this big Communist Party meeting? Uh, my, my one word answer would be yes. <laughs> Yes, more disruptions. All right, short and sweet. Stephen Engel for us there in Hong Kong. Thank you so much. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. This Thursday, tune in for our conversation with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella on this week's Bloomberg Studio 1.0, an in-depth conversation about his tenure at Microsoft, the cloud, the broader tech industry, the future of AI, all that and more. And a reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.